morning, everybody. I guess I should wait till the music stops. Thanks, PC. Uh, good morning. Welcome to Epic. How's everybody feeling this morning? Yeah? Good? Awesome. So good to see everybody. Uh, I think before I go any further, I should probably address the, uh, the foot issue here. Uh, like many of you, I was going a little too fast on Tuesday down my stairs, and I missed the last two steps and landed on my ankle, not my foot. So it's not broken, praise God, but uh, <laughs> I probably have some sort of limit ligament issue that I'll get figured out later, but that's what that's all about. And also, before I go any further, I just want to, can we all just put our hands together? Pastor Chris graduated <laughs> yesterday. There should be a... Ta-da! Woo! Yes. So awesome. So awesome. We love celebrating you, Pastor Chris, and, and your graduation and seeing all the pictures and just so proud of you for, for doing that. So great. All right. So we are in week three of our Manger Things 2 series. It was so good last year, we decided to bring it back this year. Pastor Chris has already given us two weeks of Manger Things 2, and what we're doing in this series is we're looking at characters that surround the manger, and we're pulling out characteristics from those people that we can learn from um, in our own lives. And so the first week, we looked at Mary and the favor, the huge amount of favor that was on Mary's life, and how favor is really um, another word for grace, and Mary was given grace not for status, but for service. I don't know about you, but that was kind of a big aha moment for me. And then last week we learned, Pastor Chris shared with us how obedient Joseph was and how obedience is instant and delayed obedience is really disobedience. But again, it was like, boom, smack in the face. That was kind of a big aha too. So hopefully we get an aha together today and we're going to look at a character in the Christmas story that has evolved over time and that is the innkeeper. So the innkeeper, you may have heard of this character, and and it probably goes a little something like this. Joseph and Mary arrived in a sleepy town in the middle of the night. Mary was already in labor and um, was on a donkey when her husband Joseph was frantically searching for a room for them to stay in in local inns. Desperate, he begs a reluctant innkeeper for any place for them to have their baby, and the innkeeper finally relents and makes room for them in a tumble-down stable with animals around them. Sound familiar? Yeah, sound familiar to me. Well, we're going to take a closer look at this story and using biblical truths and the character, and um, uh, we're going to look at the (laughs) biblical truths and what we know of the culture in this time to kind of dig into this story a little bit closer. But before we go any further, I love for us to just pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time together. Thank you for for your word. Thank you for every person in this room, God. I know you have a message for them, God. And I just ask for you to open our hearts to receive what you have for us. Open our ears so that we can hear your word. Thank you for allowing me to serve in this way, God. And thank you for bringing us all together today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're going to jump right in to where this character is introduced to us in the Bible. And that is in Luke 2, 4 through 7. We're going to be looking at the New King James Version You might uh, see a Bible around you. If you brought your Bible, go ahead and pull that out. The Bible app is also really awesome. Or I'll have it up here on the screen for you to follow along. But we're in Luke 2, 4 through 7. All right. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were complete for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Notice anything missing? No innkeeper. No actual innkeeper mentioned in the Bible. Weird. I thought so too. 
As with many things in our culture, in our world today, the Christmas story is we, that we all know and love and we've seen depicted on Christmas cards and in movies has been layered with tradition and embellishment until it's almost unrecognizable. So I thought it would be great for us to first spend some time unpacking this story using our Bible and what we know about the culture in this time and setting the true scene first of where Jesus was born. Well, so let's start with the word in. When we hear the word in, because there was no room for them in the inn, we think of a hotel, much like maybe the one we're in right now. Although, I don't know about you, but I can't imagine something this big sitting in the middle of Bethlehem, right? Or maybe we think of maybe like a bed and breakfast, a little place with five to ten rooms where someone could come and stay, and just because I'm staying in this room doesn't mean I know my neighbor in the next room. And someone's telling me whether there's room in this space or not. Our modern day interpretation of in is not an accurate picture of what an inn was 2,000 years ago. But perhaps even more importantly, when we look at the Greek word that was translated as inn, we find that it's not actually translated that way at all. Kataluma is the word in Greek that was translated as inn. But we also see this room, this word, Kataluma, uh, translated as guest room elsewhere in the Bible. We see it in Luke 22:11 and Mark 14:14. 14, 14. Now, these two scriptures are written by two different people giving the same account. So we're going to look at Luke 22:11. You can feel free to turn to Mark 14:14. 14, 14. They say the same thing. And it says, "And say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room, the Cataluma?" where I may eat Passover with my disciples. Consistent with this, in 2011, the NIV version of the Bible was updated, and our scripture now reads, because there was no guest room available for them. So if you had pulled out your Bible and read along with me, you probably saw guest room. And all of this is important because we're trying to set the stage of where Jesus was really born. There's also something else really important to note here. Hospitality was very important to the Jewish culture in this time. And showing hospitality to everyone, from a stranger on the street to your family member, was common practice. And relatives would be highly, highly offended if you came into town, from out of town, and did not stay at their house. And some things never change. Daniel and I are from Indiana. And if we were to ever go to Indiana, even like touch the border of Indiana and not tell our family that we were coming into town, we would be in big trouble. And it's the same with Joseph and Mary. Joseph's family lived in Bethlehem. It was his hometown. And when we look at what archeologists have found over time, and have confirmed for us is that a standard peasant home at this time in this area was typically built kind of on a hill, like into a hill or into a mountain. And the bottom level of the home was dug out and then built up upon from there. The upper area of the house that we see in this picture, the upper area of the home was where the guest room was, the room for people visiting. The lower part of the house would have been used for gathering at mealtime or for um, the, the family living in the home to kind of stay on that bottom level, roll out their mats and sleep. Also, during the cold months, they would bring their animals into the lower part of the house for safekeeping from people trying to steal them, other animals trying to eat them. And then also in those cold months, it would, it would generate some extra heat in that lower part of the room. So because of this, there was often a manger or a, or a feeding trough built into the floor or into the side of the wall. Joseph and Mary, as we read in our text, was coming from Bethlehem to be counted as part of a census. But so was other, uh, the rest of Joseph's family. So because of this, they would all have wanted to stay in the same place. So it's likely that when Joseph and Mary arrived at the family member's home seeking a guest room in the upper level of the home, they were told, it's full, 
hence no room in the inn, or more accurately, no room in the guest room, the upper level of the home. When we go home to visit Daniel's mom, we typically stay at her house because there's plenty of space, but when we are there for like a big gathering, a family event, a wedding, or, or a party, um, it can get a little crowded. Once we get Daniel's three sisters, between them there's six little ones, all the significant others, the dogs, and a partridge in a pear tree, all under one roof, it gets really tight. Most of the time, someone ends up on an air mattress on the floor in the office. Can I get, can I get, raise your hand if you're that person. I'm not going to raise my hand because that's not us. It pays to marry the oldest of a family. Seniority rules. We are not on the air mattress. <laughs> but we would take the air mattress over being separated, right? We all just want to be together when we're together. Same with Joseph's family. They wouldn't have said, sorry, you're on your own, Joseph. Good luck with your pregnant, soon-to-be wife. Even though there was no room in the house, in the guest room, they made room in the lower level of the home, the stable, if you will, or the air mattress on the floor. Clearly, Mary did not marry the oldest in her family, in his family. Overall, what do we learn from painting this accurate picture of where Jesus was born? We learn that the innkeeper that has evolved over time is really family. And the inn is really home. And what I think we can take away the most is because they were such a hospitable culture, that hospitality is love in action. We are clearly told in the Bible to love each other. In 1 Peter 4, 8 through 10, we see it written out plainly. It says, above all, love each other deeply. It doesn't even just say love each other. It says love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. <laughs> That's a little side note, without grumbling. You know, God knows us. He knows our nature, and so he had to throw that in there, too, without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gifts you have received to serve others as faithful stewards, stewards of God's grace in its various forms. And I think it's fantastic, this, this grouping of verses, because we see both love and hospitality in the same set of verses. And it's just very clear it couldn't be more clear that we're called to love and show hospitality. When digging into this text and thinking about this time of year and home, it reminded me of a story in Daniel and I's relationship. Daniel and I have been married for 10 years, and we met over a parking lot game of football in college. Of course, I won. Um, <laughs> the first year we started dating, he invited me to his family Christmas gathering at Pompey and Nan's, which is his grandparents' house. Daniel has an, a humongous family. I mean, branches that just go beyond branches. It's unbelievable how big this family is, which I love. Um, this event, this going to this Christmas event, would have been my first real introduction to the family. I had met, you know, the, the mom and the sisters, but, you know, the grandma and the grandpas and the cousins and all the extended, it would have been my first time meeting them. So Daniel comes and picks me up, and he's trying to give me the down low of who everybody is and how they're all connected and whose cousin so-and-so was married to this person and now married to this person, but both of them are going to be there and da-da-da-da-da. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. Um, Ten people in, I was like, stop, I'm not going to remember any of this. I'm so sorry. My brain doesn't work this way. And he kind of giggles, and he's like, I know. And I was like, hey, that's not funny. <laughs> So I am a bond, bundle of nerves. I just can't, like, get it together. Anyway, we arrive inevitably, and we go up to the door, and I'm like, okay, we can do this. And the door swings wide open, and instantly we are greeted with bright smiles and big hugs. There was food and laughter, and, and the atmosphere was just so joyful, and it started to mellow my nerves. And then people, I would go around the house and I would introduce myself and they would tell me who they were. And I was like, you could see probably the, the hurt on my face. Like I'm trying to like mentally put people where they are and people would go, it's okay. 
you don't have to remember. You're not going to remember. It's fine. And I'm like, oh, thank you. Thank you. So the, the time comes to when we're starting to kind of give, the, it's the present time. And we're go, we go into the living room, and I'm telling you, it's like theater-style seating to get everybody in here. We're all, like, layered on top of each other, people sitting on the couch and on the top of the couch. Bananas. Anyway. We get to gift time, and I had brought, you know, a few gifts for, like, his mom and his sisters, and I was kind of in my own head nervous about, like, were they going to like what I brought, and all of a sudden, I heard my name, and I wasn't expecting to get anything. I mean, we had only been together for six months. I wasn't a part of the family. I was really just there as kind of an observer, and so I, I hear my name. And I was like, oh, that's sweet. Daniel must have snuck something in so I wouldn't feel left out. Um, no, by the way, <laughs> he did not. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry, babe. Um, <laughs> I got the present, and it said from Lynn, which is Daniel's mom's name. And I, you know me, I'm like, mom just about to cry. I cry. If you don't know me, I cry. Like, all you have to do is that, and I cry. So I get the gift, and I'm, like, kind of in, like, oh, that was really nice of her to, to think of me. And all of a sudden, I heard my name again. And I heard my name again. And I heard my name again. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Wow. That, that's crazy. I was, so, I was so not expecting to be thought of. All of Daniel's family had planned for me to come to this gathering and wanted to make sure that I was not forgotten. The hospitality shown to me was overwhelming. The invitation for me to be counted as part of the family was such a blessing. And one of the many reasons why I fell in love with Daniel is because he was a package deal, and that package was wrapped beautifully in love. Oh. <laughs> You notice what I left out, though. I didn't, I can't for the life of me remember what the gifts were, right? I can't for the life of me remember what exactly I was given on that day other than love, other than hospitality, which is love in action. This time of year can be so overwhelming and stressful and painful and you know, I was thinking about this the other day. Sometimes when we are with people, our family members, our friends, our spouses, our kids, over time, do you notice that we put people into boxes? You know, they act a certain way, and then you kind of put them in this box. Oh, they are fill in the blank. And I don't know about you. I mean, I've been put in a box before. Like a, someone thinks I'm something, and I've grown out of that thing, and they keep wanting to put me there. And it reminded me of the story of Saul. And I shared this the other day with the production team. Uh, there's this guy in the Bible named Saul. I'll give you the quick little rundown. This is paraphrase. This is Robin's version, not the Bible version. All right. So Saul, he's this horrible guy. He's killing Christians. Uh, God says, I can, I can use this guy. I know I can use this guy for, for my kingdom. And so he knocks Saul off of his, ho uh, off of his horse with a blinding light um, and blinds him. He's blind. And he tells him to go see this guy, Ananias. So on his way to go see Ananias, Ananias is told, hey, this guy Saul is going to come see you. And Ananias is like, wait a second, I know Saul. That's the guy who's killing Christians. I'm a Christian. What are you doing, God? He's like, don't worry about it. Just do what I tell you. And then, <laughs> I told you, paraphrase version. And then Saul arrives at Ananias' house, and Ananias white, er, washes his eyes, and he can see again. And he has fresh eyes for Christians. The very people he was trying to kill hours before, he has fresh eyes for. But only God could give him those fresh eyes. And when we put, there are, there are people in our lives right now who we are kind of dreading seeing over this holiday season. Or it could be a family member, it could be a friend. And I think today God's asking us to ask him for fresh eyes for those people so that we can see them in a new light because that's the only way our heart will open and us to be able to show them hospitality. 
That was a side note. All right, so when we hop back in, I want to I look at Romans 12, 13, because it's also very clear in this text. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Hospitality is not just opening our homes. It's opening our hearts. We are called to love one another. If we look at this little passage of scripture a little closer, it starts out right there with when God's people. Well, we're all God's people. Each of us is made uniquely and specifically in his image. When you look at another person, you are looking at an image bearer of God. And sometimes I feel like we forget that. It goes on to say, remember, it goes on to say, when God's people are in need, we be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Or we could end that by saying, always be eager to open your hearts and show love. I'd like to take a little poll of the audience this morning. If you would consider Epic Church your home church, if Epic is home, put your hand up. Raise your hand. All right, awesome. Oh, that's a lot. Cool. <laughs> All right, put your hand up. I want to talk to that group first. If you raise your hand, I want to talk to you first. You know, because you rose your hand, ro- raised, raised, because you raised your hand, <laughs> We have the home, do we not? We have the home. The house is open and ready to receive guests. My question for you to consider is, are you willing to open your heart and extend the invitation to family and friends to come to your home so that they can experience Jesus? Will you show hospitality this Christmas season? Will you allow us, your epic family, to swing the doors wide open and greet your guests as our own extended family? Greet them with bright eyes and big hugs. Will you allow us to open our hearts to those you invite and show them that they are not forgotten and that they are loved? Now, while you think about that for a minute, I want to address the other group in the room. If you did not raise your hand, maybe you didn't raise it because it's your first Sunday, or maybe you've been coming for a little while and you're just trying to figure out if this is the right place for you, or you could have been coming for a while and you've just kind of been resisting really getting plugged in, which no judgment here, I've been there, I did it for years. Whatever your reason is for not raising your hand this morning, I have a message for you. Welcome home. Welcome to the church for the rest of us, where it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, what your background is, what you did last night, it doesn't matter. God loves you, and we love you too. Welcome home. Today, you get to play me in the story of visiting Daniel's family. We want to welcome you into the family with big open arms and open hearts. We want you to know that you are not forgotten and you are loved. Here's the deal, guys. We may not have it all together, but together we have it all. Do we not? We're just a group of people who are just trying to figure this thing out and we come together and we worship a God who is so good. So now that we're all one big family, What can we learn from this hospitality story that we find within the Christmas story? I've got three practical things that you can do with the lessons from today. Invite, invite, invite. (laughs) The first one is invite people to join you. We have a family Christmas party happening next Sunday. It's called Christmas in Charm City. And it's our Christmas Eve Eve gathering happening at 9 and 11 a.m. It's the same gathering, just two different times. What we learned today is that family makes room and hospitality is love in action. 
We have the house, we have the room, we just need the extended family. We are preparing for your guests, just as Daniel prepared for me and just as Joseph's family made room for him. And the gift we'd like to give this year is Jesus. Invite your family and friends to join us next week because we've got the biggest Christmas party you'll ever experience. Can I get a club horn? Yeah. <laughs> so go to christmasincharmcity.com and get more information on, on how to RSVP and bring your family. The second invite is invite people to participate. As you heard before, we have a Give Hope Challenge happening right now. It's our last week to do small things that can have a really big impact in our community. We, we don't want you to just participate. We want you to challenge others to participate with you because only light can chase out the darkness and we want to be a light in this city of hope. And for more information on that, there's these little cards that you can grab on the way out as you heard from Sammy and Lorelai, and we hope that you'll do that. The last and most important invite that there is is to invite God into your life. If you're here today and you don't know who God is, or maybe you've, you know God, but you don't, haven't experienced a living God in your life, today is your first step. Show him the ultimate hospitality and invite him into your heart today. So to do that, I'm going to ask everyone to take a posture of prayer, heads down, eyes closed. On the count of three, if that's you today, if you don't know God and you want to make room for him, if you want to accept him into your life today like you never have before, on the count of three, I want you to raise your hand. One, know that he loves you more than you will ever, ever know. Two, know that he accepts you just as you are. And three, raise your hand as a sign of accepting him into your life. One, two, thank you so much, God. Three, thank you, Lord. Thank you. You can put your hands down. Okay, everyone in the room, repeat after me. Jesus, I want to know you. I want to give you room in my heart. Thank you for a new beginning. Thank you for your grace. I confess I can't do this on my own. I need you. Forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart and make me new today. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we celebrate with those people this morning? Awesome. Okay, Lorelai's got a few, a few things for you, and then before we leave, I'll pray. Robin, thank you for the great message and reminder, right? Didn't she do awesome this morning? Yeah. We're so glad you all were here this morning. And if today was your first day, here at Epic, or if you just accepted Christ, we'd love to see you out at the Next Steps table. For those of you, for your first time, we have a great gift. It's a Till All Come to Life mug. It's awesome. And for those of you that are here for the second time, we have this pretty cool t-shirt. Ooh. Oh. Ah. Oh. That's awesome. Guess where that's at? Next Steps table. Meet us out there. We'd love to see you. For the regular attenders, we're so glad you're back today. You know, God puts in our heart to be generous because he's generous, and it all belongs to him. So we thank you for supporting Epic. You can, um, your gifts, tithes, and offerings can go in the box online or text to give. Thanks so much for being here. I'm going to turn it over to Robin to pray us out and dismiss us. Awesome. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for giving us a home, a place to worship you, a place where we can be in your presence. God, I thank you for the opportunity to serve. I thank you for every person in this room and the amazing people that we have on our team. I wish the best Christmas for all. In Jesus' name, amen. You're a good
Good fire. 